Somebody said, praise the Lord. Lord. Let's all lift our hands and worship the Lord here today. Praise God. Oh, let's worship him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Oh, let's praise him today with an uplifted voice. Let's praise him with an uplifted voice right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Amen. We thank God for what we can feel here today. And I want to give honor to this good pastor, very honorable 34 years. God has honored the burden of this good man of God in this city. Thank God for Pastor Davies today. Give him honor, appreciate he and Sister Davies and their friendship and the good hospitality since we've been here. Thank you for the nice room and the basket of goodies in the room and the good meal here last night. We say thank you for all of the hospitality of this good pastor. Just feel honored to be here today. And thank God for the good word of the Lord we heard last night. I appreciate Elder Weeks' good message that was preached here last night. And uh, looking forward to the word of the Lord here today. If you have your Bible, we're going to go to Numbers 13. Very familiar scriptures. Amen. I'm very honored today. This is a... This is a special, special honor for me to share this pulpit today with Elder Rainey, one of my good friends and elders. Thirteen years ago, I was 13 years old, and Elder Rainey was preaching revival in our home church in Canton, Ohio. He was preaching the night that I received the Holy Ghost. And this is a special honor in my life today to be able to share the pulpit with this good man of God. I don't feel worthy of that honor, but uh, very honored. And uh, I apologize we won't be able to be here for all of the meeting, but uh, I know you'll be blessed by my good friend, Elder White. Good word of the Lord. Amen. I hope the Lord will help me here today. Amen. I just want to be a blessing. I want to try to help this church if the Lord will help me. Amen. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't nervous. So I'm not going to say I'm not nervous. And uh, I just want to be a blessing. Amen. I want to get out of the way shortly and let Elder Rainey preach to us today. Thank you again, Elder Davies. Appreciate you. Numbers 13. Numbers 13, familiar, familiar scriptures. Verse 25. Numbers 13, 25. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. They told him and they said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us and surely it floweth with milk and honey and this is the fruit of it. 
Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. The Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it. For we are well able to overcome it. We are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it, is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. If you'll skip over to chapter 14, the next chapter over. Numbers 14, verse 22, Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. But my servant Caleb, Because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. Amen. I want to preach today if the Lord will help me here. And I want to ask this question. What's so big about a giant? What's so big? about a giant. Amen. I need you to pray for me today. Let's pray the Holy Ghost would move in this place. Pray that God's will would be done. Let's all pray together right now. Let's worship the Lord here today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, we want your will to be done in this place. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. Oh, let's worship him again right now. Let's praise him. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you for praying for me. You can be seated today. Amen. I'm going to go back and lead back up to where we read here today. We know the story so well of the children of Israel in Egypt. How Joseph was sold by his brethren. We know the story. There was a divine plan involved. And God used Joseph to sustain his brethren through the years of famine. Exodus chapter 1, the Bible says that Joseph died and all his brethren and all that generation. Verse 8, and there arose up a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph. Again today, I'm going to cover some familiar territory. We know the story how the children of Israel were put into slavery. And their lives were made bitter. The scriptures said their lives were made bitter with hard bondage. Every day living under the whip of those merciless taskmasters. Afflicted a life of cruel 
bondage. And some 400 years, the children of Israel were living in this cruel state of slavery. There were children that were born at that time. They were raised. They lived and died their entire lives. They knew nothing but slavery. Generations of Israelites that were in bondage in Egypt. But after 400 years, the Bible says the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning. God heard their groaning. I just want to remind you today, it's not my message, but you're not wasting your time when you pray. You're not wasting your energy when you pray. The devil is trying to attack our faith in prayer. If you don't believe something works, you aren't going to do it forever. And the devil's trying to attack our faith in the power of prayer. But prayer still changes things. Prayer still changes situations. Prayer still moves mountains. Prayer still changes situations that had been that way for 400 years. It's not too late for God to change your situation. It's not too late for God to answer your prayer and move your mountain. He's still a prayer answering God. He's still a prayer answering God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We need a renewed faith in the power of prayer. Don't you stop praying for that lost loved one. Don't you stop praying for that lost child. Don't you stop praying for that healing. It doesn't matter how many years it's been the way it is. God's still a prayer answering God. And these people had some faith. This group of people had some faith to pray that God would bring them out of a bondage they had been in for 400 years. There's nobody in here had a problem that long. So I don't know why you've quit praying about your situation. And just accept it. It's been this way for so many years. It'll always be this way. That's a lie from the devil. God can change what's been set in place for years. God can change what's been the way it's been for years. Come on, you need to keep on praying. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. They prayed, God set us free from this bondage. God, we're tired of this slavery. You know what I really like about this story is God was answering their prayer even before they could see the evidence that God was answering their prayer. It didn't look like anything was changing in their lives. They were still feeling the, the whip of the taskmaster on their back. It didn't look like anything was being done, but they didn't know that out in the middle of a desert somewhere, there was a man being commissioned by God as an answer to their prayer. God was preparing a man to lead them out of Egypt behind their backs, behind their backs. God was putting the pieces together. God was already at work. And I'm telling somebody here today, before you can see the evidence, before it looks like anything's changing, before it looks like the problem's being solved, I believe God's already answering some prayers. Do you believe it? Give him some praise here today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That's not my message, but that's a word for somebody here today. Don't you stop praying. Don't you lose your faith in the power of prayer. I cried unto the Lord and he heard my voice. Don't 
you forget it. He still hears prayer. He still answers prayer. He's still on the throne. He's still working on the behalf of his people. We know the story. Moses turned aside to see that bush that was on fire, but it was not consumed. And the Lord sent Moses. He commissioned Moses. I'm just touching a lot of highlights here today. And Moses goes to Pharaoh and he tells Pharaoh, he said, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? Brother, about 10 plagues later, he was wishing he hadn't asked that question. By the time the Lord got done introducing himself, he knew real well who the Lord was. We know know the story again. I feel intimidated today preaching a Sunday school lesson. But the 10 plagues on the Egyptians, number one, the water that was turned to blood. Number two was the frogs. Number three, the lice. Number four, the flies. The houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies and the ground covered with flies. But I will sever in that day, I will sever the land of Goshen in which my people dwell that no swarms of flies shall be there. I call that a miracle. That's a miracle. I will put a division between my people and thy people. Number five was the the diseases of the cattle, the moraine of beasts, and the Lord shall sever in that day between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt, and there shall nothing die of all that is the children of Israel's. Don't you tell me it don't pay to serve God. Don't you tell me it don't pay to be one of his children. And the Lord did that thing on the morrow and all the cattle of Egypt died. But of the cattle of the children of Israel, there died not one. I call that a miracle. A miracle. Number six was the boils. The boils that were on the Egyptians. But not on the Israelites. Number seven, the hail mingled with fire. Number eight, the locusts. Number nine, the darkness. The Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand toward heaven. That there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. Even darkness which may be felt. Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven. And there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another. Neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. We're not talking about a light bulb. We're not talking about electricity. We're talking about darkness here and light there. Dispatched by Almighty God. I call that a miracle. A miracle. I'm going to talk to us about some miracles here today. Number 10 was the death of the firstborn. All the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. Even Pharaoh's firstborn under the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill. And all the firstborn of beasts. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue. You didn't have to worry about even getting bit by a dog around that time. He said a dog isn't going to move his tongue against the children of Israel. And I'm doing this that ye may know how the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. 
We're serving a miracle working God. And Pharaoh in his stubbornness, Pharaoh in his stubbornness would not let the children of Israel go worship God and serve God. But, but when he arises in the middle of the night and his own firstborn is dead, by the time that the Egyptians are arising in every home, the firstborn has been slain. Brother, that got their attention. And they were ready for the children of Israel to get out of there. Leave. Go. Serve your God. You need some gold? We'd be glad to give it to you. Need some silver? We'd be glad to give it to you. Need some clothing? Here you go. Take some clothing. Take some provisions for the journey. They were glad to see him leave. And the Bible says they spoiled the Egyptians. When they left from Egypt. Spoiled them. There's cabinets in Egyptian homes that didn't have nothing in them. There's closets in the Egyptian homes that didn't have nothing in them. There's living rooms in the Egyptian homes that didn't have a couch anymore. They spoiled the Egyptians in their leaving from Egypt. You hear me? The children of Israel saw the miraculous hand of God in leading them out of Egypt. They saw the awesome power and ability of God. He brought them out with a mighty stretched out arm. And he promised them a good land. He promised them a large land. A land flowing with milk and honey. I hope you haven't forgot all the effort that God went through to get you out of Egypt. I hope you haven't forgot all the work that God put into you to get you set free from bondage and get you set free from slavery. Miracle after miracle after miracle that God worked in your life to bring you out of bondage so that chains could fall off. He brought you out with a mighty stretched out arm. God did for you what nobody else could do for you. God did for you what the drug counselor couldn't do for you. God did for you what the marriage counselor couldn't do for you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. They head out of Egypt and God uses a special miracle to lead them. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night to lead them in the way. I call that a miracle. When the cloud moved, they knew it was time to move. They had divine guidance. They had divine protection. They come to the Red Sea and it looks like there's no way across. They come to the Red Sea and somebody looks over their shoulder and sees the Egyptians are pursuing after them. And they get nervous and they get in a panic and, and they go to, to Moses and, oh, we just should have died in Egypt. Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And God sent a great wind that night and prepared a dry path through the Red Sea. And they walked through on dry land in the midst of the sea. The waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. I call that a miracle. They saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. Israel walked through on dry land. And when the Egyptians came through, them walls of water came down. And they saw, everybody say saw. Everybody say saw. The Egyptians dead on the seashore. And they saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. That's more than a Sunday school story. It's not a fairy tale. 
it really happened and it's a miracle you know what happens after God gives us a great victory and man we see the Egyptians dead on the seashore and when it looked like there was no way God made a way you know what we do man we pull out the tambourines and, and we go to dancing and shouting and they pull out the tambourines you can read it in Exodus 15 they're rejoicing and oh the Lord is a man of war he's drowned Pharaoh and his chariots in the sea they're rejoicing and they're clapping and they're dancing and, and man they're having a great time and you know what happens when we have good church you get thirsty if you ain't never left church thirsty you ain't a true worshiper we get thirsty and they come to Myra and they're thirsty and the waters are bitter somebody tastes that water and said whoa 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 I'm in trouble. That stuff was bad. And, but God showed Moses a tree. Said you throw that tree into them waters and I'll make the bitter waters sweet. And he threw that tree into them waters and the bitter waters became sweet. I call that a miracle. I call that a miracle. Exodus 17, they come to a dry place. There's no water. And they're thirsty, they're thirsty and they're complaining because there's no water. But God gave them water out of a rock. I call that a miracle. Every morning there's bread coming down from heaven. Manna, bread from heaven. I don't know what manna tastes like, but God's not a second class cook. I promise you it was good eating. It was everything they needed. It was everything that they needed to be sustained. In a wilderness, God was providing for them. I call that a miracle. They saw the victory over Amalek. That when they held up Moses' hands, Israel prevailed. When he let down his hands, Amalek prevailed. They saw miracle after miracle after miracle had a front row seat witnessing the miraculous. I've covered a lot and I've skipped a lot. I hope that's okay. When we get to our text, when we get to our text from the little bit that I could read, it was somewhere between a year and a half and two years since they had come out of Egypt. They've been traveling through the elements, traveling through the wilderness almost two years. And their clothes have not waxed old. Their sandals have not wore out. You get a woman to wear the same pair of shoes for two years, that's a miracle. Their sandals have not wore out. I mean, after two years, here they are, here they are. They're on the edge of the promised land. They're on the edge of what's kept them traveling the last two years. They're right there. They can see it. And everybody's excited. Everybody's thrilled. And, and man, they're, they're jumping up on the tallest rock they can get up on trying to get a glimpse of the promised land. And Moses said, just settle down here. Take it easy, we're going to take one man from each tribe and send him in to spy out the land. Y'all still with me? I am not going to preach all day, but I'm just now getting where I want to go. Twelve men go in and they spy out the land and they see the evidence of the promised land. They're gone for 40 days. And after 40 days, they come back to the camp of the children of Israel, loaded down with, I mean, these clusters of grapes and pomegranates and figs and, and all this various kinds of fruit from the land of Canaan. And everybody's excited and, wow, look at this. Surely it is a land that floweth with milk and with honey. God didn't lie to us. Look at the evidence. 
Look at the fruit we saw in the promised land. It's better than we expected. It's better than we thought it would be. Surely it floweth with milk and with honey. And man, everybody's excited and they're rejoicing and they're eating them grapes. Man, forget the garlics. We didn't have nothing like this in Egypt. They're excited and celebration time. And in the midst of all of that, some negative, evil reporter with a big mouth lifted his voice and said, we be not able, we can't do it, we can't, we can't do it. I saw walls. You should have seen the giants. We can't do it. We are not able. There's no way. A negative evil report on the edge of the promise. And panic broke out in the congregation. People started getting nervous and the Bible says people began to weep. They wept and they cried and, and people were getting upset. And what do you mean we can't take the promised land? Well, what do you mean God promised it to us? What do you mean God said it was ours? We've been traveling two years to get right here. Panic broke out in the congregation. I know that because the Bible says Caleb had to stand up and still the people. Just calm down. Hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. Don't listen to that negative, evil, pessimism. Don't listen to that. Caleb said, I'll tell you what I feel. I feel like we are well able to overcome it. We are well able. Let's go up at once and possess it. For we are well able to overcome it. But there was a contention. There was a conflict between the negative and the positive. There was a conflict between doubt and faith. There were 10 evil reporters. And then there was Joshua and Caleb that said, whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Giants? Giants? Whoa, 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 whoa. Did God bring us through the Red Sea? Did God bring us through the Red Sea? And what's so big about a giant? Did, did, did God give us water out of a rock? We were so thirsty. And God gave us water out of that rock. Does anybody remember that? Then what are you getting nervous about? And what are you getting scared for? And why are you lending ear to unbelief? Didn't God turn the bitter waters into sweet waters? Didn't you see it happen? Then what's so big about a giant? God's done too much. God's brought us through too much. God's performed too many miracles for us to start focusing on giants now. Come on, let's worship the Lord. Oh, let's worship him right now.
be seated. I feel this on my heart today. There's somebody here on the edge of your promise. There's somebody here on the edge of your deliverance. There's somebody here on the edge of your miracle. There's somebody here on the edge of your healing. There's somebody here on the edge of receiving the Holy Ghost. And right here on the edge of the promise, the adversary's trying to get you to focus on giants. But if you look back down memory lane, God's brought you through too much. You've already seen God answer too many prayers. God's opened too many doors. You've seen too much to doubt God now. You've seen too much to doubt God now. God's done too much for you to get a negative spirit now. God's answered too many prayers for you to get a negative spirit now. Come on, what's so big about a giant? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Those 10 men with an evil report, their attitude was what it was because of what they were focusing on. What you're focusing on is what's determining your attitude. If you got a negative attitude, you're focusing on the wrong thing. If you're depressed all the time, you're focusing on the wrong thing. If you're sad all the time, you're focusing on the wrong thing. If you're mad all the time, you're focusing on the wrong thing. If you're bitter, you focused on the wrong thing for too long. We need a, we are able spirit. We are able, we are able. Come on, you change what you're focusing on, it'll change your attitude. You see somebody that's happy, it's not because they don't have problems. They just said, I'm not focusing on the strength of the giants. I'm gonna focus on the strength of God. I'm not focusing on how big the giants are. I'm gonna focus on how big my God is. Oh, let's worship the Lord right now. Praise the Lord. Those 10 men with an evil report, they focused on the giants, the people the walls, the obstacles, and totally lost focus on the promise. And the adversary right on the edge of your promise wants you to focus on the present current giant and totally forget what you've already seen God do, what you've already come through, McMinnville, we've seen too much to let a negative spirit get in this church now. You've seen God do too much to start believing an evil report now. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost here today.
Be seated. The attitude of the majority is going to determine what happens. I believe if it would have been 10 with faith and only two doubt, they would have went into the promised land that day. But because there was 10 doubt, 10 with a negative spirit, 10 with an evil report, can I tell you, it was more than just a little pessimism. It was a spirit. Because the Lord said Joshua and Caleb, they had another spirit. So that lets me know the attitude of those 10 fellas. It was a spirit. It was a spirit to be negative and complain and look at the giants and say, there's no way, it's impossible. We possibly can't bring them down. Those 10 said, man, they're too big. We can't defeat them. Joshua and Caleb said, man, they're too big. There's no way we can miss them. We got a good target. We got a good target. Hey, there is no giant today that you're facing. I feel the Holy Ghost here. That ought to make you question God. That ought to make you back up in your faith. I refuse to focus on giants. Did God bring you out of Egypt? Did God bring you out of Egypt? <laughs> Did God fill you with the Holy Ghost? Did God set you free from slavery? Did God make a way when it looked like there was no way? Come on, did God bring you through the Red Sea? Has God provided when you were in a dry place? Have you forgot the victory over Amalek? Come on, what's so big about a giant? If God be for us, it doesn't matter how many giants are against us. We are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Clap your hands to the Lord and praise right now. Oh, go ahead and praise him. That negative, evil report. Right on the edge of the promise, they got divided. And the attitude of the majority is going to determine what happens. The attitude of the majority determines whether we take promises or walk around in circles for 40 years. What's the attitude of the majority here today? That's going to determine what happens. That's going to determine what happens. Is there a Joshua? Is there a Caleb? That said, what's so big about a giant? Come on, look what the Lord has already done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just in time. I'm going to praise his name. Look what the Lord has already done. Those 10 negative, those 10 negative evil reporters, they never saw the walls of Jericho come down. But Joshua and Caleb did. Those 10 with that negative evil report were not able. It can't be done. It won't happen in our church. There's no way. We look like a bunch of grasshoppers. They're so big, we're grasshoppers. 
And I could tell by the way that giant looked at me, I was a grasshopper in his sight too. Those ten with that evil report died and were buried in that wilderness. They never saw the walls of Jericho come down. They never saw the sun stand still. But Joshua and Caleb did. They never saw the moon stand still. But Joshua and Caleb did. The believers today are going to see things the unbelievers don't see. Come on, if you'll change what you're focusing on, it'll be easier to get your hands in the air. It'll be easier to have some joy. You change what you're focusing on, it'll change your attitude. I'm not telling God how big my giants are. I'm going to tell my giants how big my God is. I feel like God would like to heal somebody here today. Come on, what's so big about a giant? What's so big about a giant? Woo! Shalalala boho kataya. Feel the Holy Ghost here. I understand. I understand James 5. Is any among you sick and afflicted? Let him pray. Call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. I understand that. But Mark 16 tells me that these signs shall follow them that believe. And it gives a list. And the last one on that list, the believers shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That isn't just referring to the ministry. That isn't just referring to a preacher. But there's power and authority in a real believer. If you're a believer here today, Come on, if you're a Joshua, if you're a Caleb, I want you to reach over and pray with that brother, that sister standing next to you. Husbands and wives, come on. God can do a miracle right now if you're a believer. Believers can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. God can give you the Holy Ghost today. God can heal your body today. God can deliver you today. Come on, lift your voices in faith right now. What's so big about a giant? What's so big about a giant? Come on, lift your voice in faith right now. You've seen too much to doubt God now. God's done too much for you, for you to doubt him now, right on the edge of your promise. Come on, you can get your healing right now. You can get the Holy Ghost right now. God can forgive you of all your sins right now. You can be washed in the blood right now. You can find brand new victory right now. Come on, don't you focus on them giants. God brought you through the Red Sea. God's given you manna. Bread from heaven. God's given you victory over Amalek. God's given you water out of a rock. God's provided for you. God's protected you. God's guided you. Right now, we need to rebuke a negative spirit. Right now, lift your voices. We need to rebuke a negative spirit. We need to rebuke an evil report. We need to rebuke the voice of doubt right here on the edge of the promise. Come on, sisters, lift your voices. Come on, young ladies, young men, lift your voices. Come 
on brothers lift your voices you're on the edge of the promise rebuke that doubt in Jesus name rebuke that unbelief in Jesus name rebuke that negative spirit in Jesus name he's able today to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us come on the believers shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover anointing with oil in the name of the Lord the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up if he's committed any sins they shall be forgiven him come on young people don't you surrender to that evil report don't you yield to that negative voice don't you believe that negative voice come on young ladies you are able we are well able Come on, lift your voices right now. We're well able. We are well able. He's answered too many prayers, healed you too many times open too many doors move too many mountains come on what's so big about a giant what's so big about a giant lift your voice lift your voice let the Holy Ghost touch you right now let the Holy Ghost touch you right now let the Holy Ghost touch you right now Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one.